Mais. Olá, pessoal. Bom dia a todos. Obrigada por estarem conosco nessa manhã no nosso terceiro webinar da série de pré ao pós-tratamento. Pesquisas para o avanço do biogás realizado pela UTFPR e também pelo CBiogás. É, o nosso objetivo com essas séries de webinars é lançar né, e promover a segunda turma da pós-graduação em tecnologias da cadeia produtiva do biogás. Eu sou a professora Janaína, eu sou uma das professoras da pós-graduação e também sou consultora da UNIDO, a Organização das Nações Unidas para o Desenvolvimento Industrial. É, então, essa especialização ela é realizada no formato EAD, ou seja, facilita a participação de alunos e profissionais do Brasil todo. E o edital está disponível já no link que a gente vai colocar ali no chat para vocês acessarem. E as, in as inscrições se iniciam em agosto, ok? Então, é uma, é uma pós-graduação, como eu comentei, muito relevante para a nossa área de biogás, principalmente. Todos os professores são mestres ou doutores e também são consultores e profissionais bem atuantes na área do biogás. E o principal diferencial que a gente encontra né, nessa pós-graduação é a questão de networking. Né? Nós temos alunos de várias empresas, profissionais de diversas áreas, então há uma troca de conhecimento e experiência bem relevante. E também a importância disso é o contato com projetos tanto nacionais quanto internacionais também. Então, qualquer dúvida que vocês tiverem sobre a pós-graduação, se vocês acessarem o link, tiverem alguma questão, vocês podem perguntar ali no chat, que a gente vai tentar responder durante a nossa nosso webinar, ok? Então, e sobre a questão dos webinars anteriores, dos dois outros webinars, webinars vocês podem acessar também no canal do Save Gas no YouTube, eles estão disponíveis lá. Então, hoje nós teremos uh, né, uma conversa com a professora Jean Mitriolo, da Universidade do Sul da Dinamarca. Vou falar um pouquinho, vou ler para vocês aqui o currículo dela. Então, ela é graduada em Química Agrícola na Coreia do Sul e doutora em Energia e Tecnologias Ambientais pela University of Southern Denmark. Ela é professora associada do Departamento de Química e Biotecnologia da Universidade da Dinamarca. É, ela é especialista com reconhecimento internacional em bioprocessamento sustentável para energia e produtos de alto valor para a sustentabilidade global. Ela lidera o grupo de pesquisa em biorefinarias e biocombustíveis da universidade e ela tem 18 anos de experiência em pesquisa profissional na Dinamarca e também na Coreia do Sul, na área de tratamento de águas residuais e resíduos, né, por meio do tratamento bioquímico, bioremediação, aeróbia e anaeróbia. Então, ela tem diversas também conexões aqui no Brasil, principalmente na parceria com a UTFPR e com o CEI Biogás, e ela fez parte do grupo de palestrantes internacionais da nossa primeira turma da pós-graduação em, em tecnologias do biogás, né, realizada pela UTFPR, em que ela veio para o Brasil em 2018. Então, eu vou daqui a pouquinho já é, passar a palavra para ela, mas ao final da apresentação, é, a gente vai responder algumas perguntas que vocês fizerem, ok? E a gente solicita que as perguntas sejam feitas em português mesmo, tá? Para facilitar na hora da gente fazer a tradução e enviar para ela. É, so, Dr. Triolo, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Uh, and before you start your presentation, I would like to know if how was your experience here in Brazil? I know you have been here in 2018. So I would like to know if you have a good impression of our country, if you like your travel here, if you enjoyed your period here with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, uh, two years ago, 2018, I had a wonderful time in Brazil and uh, visiting Itabu power plant and uh, giving seminars and giving lecture at the University of uh, State University of Paraná. And I miss all the wonderful colleagues and nature and food in Denmark, uh, food in Brazil, I'm sorry, food in uh, Brazil. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> because I can see you guys, right? I really like to say hello to everyone. And we hope you can come back here for our second uh, classes here from the, the post-graduation. So hopefully yes. you're going to be here with us very soon. <laughs> yeah, it is my pleasure. Oh, great. So, Dr. <laughs> great. so you're going to have about 35 to 40 minutes to present. And after that, we are going to have the open session for questions. Okay. So mm -hmm. have a great presentation. Okay. So thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Professor Thiago or inviting this online seminar. And today I will give some talks about the co-digestion strategies. But before that, I will introduce our research activities at SDU in Denmark. So next slide. 
So here you can see our group members and resource capacity, but the list of group members are not fully updated. But the resource groups calls SDU, Bar Refinery, and Biofuel Group, where I'm heading this group. I focus on the fuel and chemical production, and we work with the biomass pre-treatment uh, pre as well. So currently, we have some biogas upgrading project, biomass pre-treatment, and greenhouse gas emission projects. Uh, the next slide. So here you can see the overview of what we are doing for the green transition for future bio-based society. The idea is that we are going to produce biogas from agriculture residues like animal manure and the byproducts and upgrade these biogas into the biomethane with over 97% of methane content. So we can replace natural gas, which is raw material for any kind of bio-based bio product. So apart from this biogas and biogas upgrading, so we also work with some fermentation to produce some different organic acids like here, that succinic acid and lactic acid, also propionic acids. And also, and we do a lot uh, with this uh, biogas upgrading using LGI. Uh, and done or uh, some CO2 capture from LGI. So here, that uh, regarding the biogas upgrading, that we try to develop the advanced biological biogas upgrading. In this case, we are using a biotrickling reactor. The biotrickling reactor is uh, similar to a uh, UASP reactor but with some filling materials inside the reactor. Uh, so we are going to use this uh, trickly reactor because this reactor doesn't require high energy consumption and also it is environmentally friendly technology because we utilize all the carbon from biogas. You, know, you mean that uh, inside the biogas, uh, around 65% of methane and 35% of carbon dioxide. So we use this carbon dioxide to convert uh, to the methane. So in this way, so we can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is uh, our upgrading technology that we are doing now. and. Uh, we also explore carbon capture by cultivation of algae, where we can utilize the carbon dioxide from biogas. So there are two ways of a carbon capture, uh, either using biotrickling reactor, in this case, we will have to use hydrogen from wind power, or through this photochemical reactor. And in this case, we uh, cultivated algae uh, using carbon dioxide from biogas, and also we can utilize wastewater. So we combining wastewater and anaerobic digestion. In this case, we can remove uh, the COD and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from the wastewater, while we are converting biogas into biomethane and. Uh, uh, through uh, cultivation of algae. So this biomethane can be raw material for algae jet fuel or also some bio jet fuel. Or this biomethane can be also raw material for any kind of different bio-based uh, products. Mm -hmm. And uh, next. Uh, so we also involved some uh, EU projects in here and producing biopulp for biogas productions. And also we are going to also produce uh, ecological fertilizer and also alternative uh, pre-treatment for a uh, green guard waste for uh, biogas productions. I remember Professor Thiago visited uh, SDU here and we collaborate with this alternative environmental friendly uh, pre-treatment. So this is very similar with uh, what uh, Thiago, Professor Thiago is doing. Uh, 
And uh, so here you can see some bioproduction technology from food waste here. So this is a reality of a food waste from the business sector or supermarket from the municipal here. So after this uh, uh, the separation process, you know, we finally produce a, a biopulp which is ready for biogas production. <laughs> Now, uh, before at, uh, I, I know that the title of this uh, presentation is uh, today is like a code digestion optimization. So before I explain code digestion, so I need to talk about the history of the Danish biogas industry. Uh, I remember that I showed this slide to our Brazilian colleagues and students before, uh, but. I'll briefly go through this again to emphasize why cold digestion is important. First, at, after oil crisis in 1970s, and Denmark started bagus production, which we call first generation in bagus production. So we have some first generation, second generation, third generation bagus production in, in Denmark here. So but at that time, unfortunately, there was no bagus. And of course, there is no economy because there is no biogas, mainly because of a low productivity, <laughs> not much methane because they are only used, uh, they used only uh, animal manure. So they didn't add any energy dense uh, uh, feed stock. So, and also a poor understanding of animal digestion. So, uh, there was first trial, it fails. But in 1980s, the centralized bagus plants, its industrial scale bagus plants, started coal digestion. So I mean that uh, I, they don't use only animal manure, but has started some mixing uh, animal manure with some of feedstock. At the time, they could receive money from the waste provider, so which we call a gate fee. So. And they could also get much more methane yield from the cost substrate. So there's some double effect. Get a fee and more biogas from a coal feedstock, from coal digestion. So Denmark is the first country that started coal digestion, uh, eight years uh, coal digestion. And eight years ago, which is in 2012, and Denmark set a new long term strategy which means that 50% of uh, total animal manure must be used for biogas production. But for the last eight years of a great trial here, an effort we, we have made that now we are close to 50%. So there is no statistic uh, in 2020 because but I remember from 2018, uh, the data, we are very close to 35, 40, but I don't have exact number in my mind now. So, so let's just see here that in this slide, we can see the history of annual biogas production from the first, second, and third generations. Uh, here, the y-axis shows tetrajoules, so don't be confused. So this year, 2020, uh, will be around 20 petrojoules per year. So Denmark is very, very small country compared to Brazil. So, uh, so this pet, 20 petrojoules here. So it shows in this figure, so there have been dramatic uh, development of bagus industry in Denmark for last couple of decades. And that coal digestion really support this development. And then next, so here, I would like to compare methane potential of typical liquid feedstock, for example, animal manure and wastewater. And right now, I do not have any data of methane potential of Venesa. You know, the Venesa is the ethanol, bioethanol product, uh, the byproducts, you, you know best the length of uh, bioethanol. But it will be similar to methane potential of a liquid animal manure here. I, so as you can see here, liquid biomass and coal substrate typically solid or semi-solid biomass. For uh, example, uh, animal byproduct like um, animal byproduct like uh, supermarket uh, waste, 
uh, like a bacon and a sausage, uh, bacon sausage ham, or uh, or some abattoir waste. Abattoir waste is slaughterhouse waste. A slaughterhouse waste because the compared to the liquid bonus. You can see some animal manure, right? In case of animal manure, at the seven cubic meter of methane per ton of animal manure, and this uh, brewery waste is even lower. But in case of this animal byproducts and abattoir waste, you can see here around 145 a cubic meter of methane, and in case of abattoir waste, at 157 cubic meter of a methane per ton of biomass. That is simply because uh, two uh, reasons, uh, high dry matter content, and the second reason is that high lipid and, and protein content. But but I have to uh, say that, uh, uh, but animal menu is a really fantastic uh, feedstock because there are some macronutrition and also micronutrition and also indigenous bacteria needed for other digestions. But unfortunately, uh, the other way, this uh, uh, animal manure is, is uh, like a uh, solvent for this, this wet digestions because hydrolysis of this core substrate. Because uh, some of the students here that I remember and I gave a lecture about this uh, uh, anaerobic digestion biochemical process, like uh, uh, hydrolysis and acidogenesis and acetogenesis and methanogenesis are here, right? And, and here, the first step will be hydrolysis. So it's, it's a wet fermentation, wet digestion. We need to have a water. And in this way, and the animal menu is like a solvent or still providing macronutrition, micronutrition, and also indigenous uh, methanogen bacteria inside. So, so let's see, uh, in this slide, you can see the typical feedstock mixture for cold digestion where around, let's see uh, the figure here, 75% of animal manure in total feedstocks and the rest of cold feedstock is around 25%. In this 25%, you can see some uh, fat and fish waste and dairy waste and slaughterhouse waste and also other some solid type of manure here. As I mentioned before, that lipid and protein has quite high energy content uh, compared to carbohydrates and uh, some volatile fatty acids. So these animal byproducts are most popular feedstock to biogas industry, of course. But because of a high competition of biogas plants, because they all want to have this kind of biomasses. In, in this way, uh, many new bagus plants, newly made new bagus plants, have to utilize some other lignocellulosic biomasses. Uh, lignocellulose biomass like uh, agricultural residues or a green uh, grass or uh, municipal organic waste is not typical lignocellulose biomass, but all the some alternative pharmacies may require some uh, pretreatment or and suffer from some uh, low biodegradability or uh, low uh, biogas productions. So here you can see some food waste and a uh, wheat straw. In Denmark, there are so many so wheat straws here, uh, but the uh, uh, characteristics of wheat straw are very similar to uh, bagasse, uh, which is a byproduct of bioethanol in, in Brazil. So in case of Brazil, the land of ethanol, byproduct of bioethanol, for example, bagasse and vinesse could also be alternative uh, cause of rate. And, um, so here that the, some statistics are here for over the recent four years of uh, biomass for biogas production in Denmark. So here you can see that around 75% of animal manure and around 25% of coal feedstocks. Most of coal feedstocks are here in, uh, let's see the right blue color. So that is industrial waste. This industrial waste include uh, some supermarket waste. 
and expired some ham and sausage, uh, so all these um, processed animal byproducts and uh, of bacons. So, but there is very small portion of any crop. Uh, you can see some red color here, and typically maize and uh, sugar beet. So the small amount of any crop is also used for bagus productions, uh, typically for the farm scale bagus productions. And also you can see some household organic waste uh, in purple color. Uh, if we compare that this household organic waste, it's like a typically a municipal food waste, right? Municipal food waste, the increase of this municipal food waste for bagus production is not really clearly shown in this figure, uh, but the use of household organic waste, food waste, is uh, gradually increasing in Denmark. So I don't know if it's gradually or like, rapidly increasing. So we, 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 are, we are going to use uh, uh, municipal food waste for bagus production for the next uh, some uh, years. So this is the overview of uh, co feedstock and of uh, prime feedstock in Denmark. You know? And uh, before I go further, uh, the co-digestion that I would like to briefly uh, explain the uh, difference between uh, two reactors like a CSTR reactor and also UASB reactor here mm, for the under digestion, the two different, the main different reactor types, but normally uh, the four the co-digestion uh, CSTR uh, reactor is most uh, suitable because this CSTR reactor can endure high TS content here. TS means uh, total solids. TS, or you can, also call, you can also call a dry matter, high dry matter content up to uh, 20%. And in case of above 20% of TS uh, diameter, it, it has become um, a solid state on digestion. And I heard that Professor Passat from Australia uh, gave a lecture uh, before regarding the solid state of digestion. digestions here. Today is the cold digestions using CSTR, the maximum TS uh, for the wet from a wet digestion will be 20%, but for the CSTR reactor, it must be much lower than 20% for the availability of a pumping. Yes. Mm -hmm. So here we can see some UASP reactor. This USB reactor is typically for the wastewater like uh, Vanessa. If you're going to only treat Venus and also other industrial fermentation wastewater, this can be some brewery wastewater or sugary wastewater or municipal wastewater. Uh, and this type of reactor is very common for other parts of uh, Brazil, as you know, such as Sao Paulo region. And uh, but this uh, USB reactor doesn't really fit to cold digestion because uh, this reactor can only work fine for the liquid biomass, as well, long as you remember the TS content, the limit of TS content is around two uh, percent. So in this uh, case of this cold digestion using CSTR can also be used to actually for a municipal sweet plant, like municipal wastewater, uh, but it requires new legislation because it's all about the legislation here. So I don't know about the legislation in Brazil, but in Denmark with a new uh, legislation, uh, the commercial bagus plants like uh, Commercial bagus plant utilizing typically animal manure, they co digest with the industrial business sector uh, organic waste. Uh, but in case of this municipal sewage plant, wastewater treatment plant, they can now utilize uh, not only uh, the sludge, but also a mix with the municipal food waste. So, that because it's important to avoid competition between. Uh, industrial uh, bagus plant using typically animal manure 
as a plant feedstock and also um, uh, sweet plant, the plant feedstock will be a sludge here. So there are two different biogas sector typically. Yeah. So now we will talk about the cold digestion. So what, what to decide here? So for the cold digestion, uh, that what we have to decide and how we can optimize the cold digestion. There are two different considerations. First, a feedstock, and the second, operational conditions. So first, feedstock, the minimum requirement of feedstock is uh, methane potential. So here, as written BMP, so BMP is biochemical methane potential. So I think most of you are familiar with the BMP, which is biochemical methane potential. So of course, the BMP must be as high as possible and driver content must be maximum approximate 15%. Uh, I think wet fermentation, wet digestion is up to maybe 20% per, 20 is available because of uh, the pumping availability that uh, maximum 15%. And also um, one of the some guidelines here, CN ratio here. And here C means uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen, N stands for nitrogen. So the nitrogen, uh, this CN ratio, right? And the ratio between carbon and nitrogen shows a balance between carbon source and nitrogen source. Uh, that is because to balance macronutrition in honor of digestion, which means that if too much carbon, and then on a, anaerobic microorganisms do not have enough nitrogen for the cell growth because the main composition of this on bacteria will be protein inside. But on the other hand, there's too much nitrogen, it will be risk of ammonia inhibition, free ammonia inhibition. I don't know how much you, of you are familiar with this uh, free ammonia inhibitions, but uh, we will talk a little bit more about ammonia inhibition later. So, and in case of reactor operations, uh, temperature, we have to choose either thermophilic or mesophilic. Uh, thermophilic typically 52 Celsius degree, or mesophilic uh, typically 37 Celsius degree or 42 degree. Uh, Cyclophilic or uh, unheated bagus digester, uh, this also could be possible, but this is not really, um, as long as I know, is utilized in uh, Brazil. But also one of the most important parameters are organic loading rate, organic loading rate. So besides the temperature and organic loading rate, uh, retention time is also another very important parameter. So feeding rate and reactor capacity, how big the bugs digest should be, can also be determined based on the organic loading rate and also retention time. Uh, pH must be neutral and close to uh, seven, but in case of this acidification of a reactor by reactor, if a pH drop of maybe below 5.5, 5, 5.5, 5 .5, uh, this will be an indicator that there are something wrong with the biochemical process in the reactor. Which means that it is important that you do not adjust the pH. Some, 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 someone really does adjust some pH because the pH go down in 5.5 uh, and add some alkali. But use this pH drop as an indicator. Uh, so, and the next, um, here we like to see that uh, there are many in real scale bugs plant, uh, or it does need to be real scale bugs plants, also some demonstration scale and parallel scale bugs plants. There are many different reasons for failure, and there's no bugs. Uh, I mean, there is no and very little bugs productions uh, because there's something wrong. 
So here in the table, I listed uh, first uh, free ammonia inhibition and long chain fatty acids inhibitions, LCFA. Uh, so this uh, uh, LCFA long chain fatty acids inhibition, if uh, too much alcohol, um, it is not alcohol, I'm sorry, it was LA oil or some lipid rich feedstock like fish waste or ground meat, or uh, this can be some olive oil, or are uh, introduced to, to bugs rectum. There will be some uh, LCFA inhibitions. So apart from free ammonia inhibition or LCFA inhibitions, uh, typically because of a high amount of a protein and uh, lipid, there also could be some volatile fatty acid inhibitions. In case of volatile fatty acid, the inhibition is uh, this is a um, indirect inhibition because the uh, volatile fatty acid uh, is a product of uh, of a free ammonia because of the accumulation of a volatile fatty acid because that methanogenesis is inhibited by the free ammonia here. So, but. Uh, Apart from free FA, and the sulfide inhibition is also typically from industrial waste water, but most of the time the failure of an digestion is because of overloading. And when overloading occurs and generation of organic uh, acids, I mentioned before that organic fatty acids like uh, organic fatty acids for FA, and uh, too fast compared to methanogenesis. So because of that, if uh, too much uh, volatile fatty acids are produced, that reactor can easily drop, uh, the pH can go below 5.5. So under pH 5.5, methane production will be slowed down and there is no methane production. That is because of that and uh, volatile fatty acids and also pH is uh, there are most uh, important parameters to monitor uh, the reactor if it goes good or not. So today, uh, uh, more about this free ammonia and overloading uh, problem here that we will have to optimize. Uh, then the question is that uh, how we can get methane production as high as possible while there is no overloading and no reactor acidifications. We may use this simple kinetic model to predict methane production and decide optimal organic loading rate. And some of uh, Bagas designing industry use uh, this uh, model for uh, Bagas industry. So I remember that I lectured this model when I provided short progress course in the universities in Denmark, in Brazil, I'm sorry, it is in Brazil. So maybe at uh, some of uh, people uh, attending this seminar are familiar with this model. I'm not going through, I'm not uh, going through this model, um, but briefly saying that using this model, you can predict the daily methane production rate and also at uh, total methane production, cumulative methane productions. And also you can simulate the effect of temperature, also retention time, HRT, and also organ lowering rate to see the effect on the methane yield. So therefore, uh, using this model, you can assume the opt optimal organic loading rate. You can actually figure out, uh, approximate optimal organic loading rate by using this uh, very simple model here. So if you are going to pre uh, predict methane productions, what you need is here looking at this um, uh, equation here. First, you need to have a BMP biochemical methane potential of feedstocks. So here will be a feedstock mixture. So if we have uh, uh, five, 10 uh, different feedstocks, this will be representative BMP of a feedstock mixture. And also VS concentration of over feedstock mixture. 
and temperature from 20 to 60 degrees Celsius, Celsius degree. Um, and then also you can also um, um, hydraulic irritation time. This hydraulic irritation time can be endless, whatever you want. Yes. And then let's move to the next slide. Uh, so if uh, before that, if you are going to predict methane productions, and then you can simply use this, and then afterwards, this result will be result of uh, calibration predicted value. So afterwards, what is best, and do you operate real scale bug uh, reactor or um, uh, what is that a power scale bug reactor, and then validate validate mother, and then it can be start used. So here in this slide, you can see the effect of organic matter contents on daily methane production rate at different retention time. So in this figure, depending on retention time, the relation between the concentration of VS and the methane productions are different. So following this figure, so let's look at a yellow curve. The HRT 15 days with a VS concentration will give a best result. But on the other hand, at, uh, what if the volatile solid concentration is around 200 gram per kilogram? So let's have a look at this uh, y uh, x axis here around 200 or a maximum 225. There's almost no methane production because of uh, over overloading. So this uh, y x axis is only showing the uh, volatile solid concentrations. The volatile solid concentration, uh, but the relation between the S content and organic lowering rate is very simple. So when you have the S concentration, you divide it by uh, retention time, then the result will show the organic lowering rate. And the, by looking at this effect of organic matter contents of, uh, on the daily methane production rate, then simply can see the both effect of HRT and also effect of uh, volatile solid concentrations uh, together with the best optimal uh, organic lowering rate. So this is also an example of uh, simulation procedures, which means uh, uh, optimization procedure for co-digestion. It doesn't need to be exactly co-digestion, but this to avoid any kind of uh, inhibition. Why? Because if, the, if you only utilize uh, animal manure or a switch sludge, which has a very low uh, uh, methane con uh, very low at the volatile solid uh, concentration because liquid uh, uh, there's typically around only one or two percent of TS content. So there will not be any inhibition, but the problem is that very low methane concentration. So if you're going to use this uh, at the cold digestion, the problem could be the inhibition because of overloading problem. So the Target is that you're going to produce methane productions, methane as much as possible while you're avoiding uh, inhibition here. So this uh, uh, could be, or uh, uh, Shenhen Chen and Hashimoto model could be very uh, effective to avoid uh, some inhibition for cold digestions. And we have some more, more and not only a uh, function of organic loading rate, but you can also simulate a function of HRT. HRT is retention time uh, to figure out the methane production rate and also accumulate the uh, methane yield. So you can see some two figures to the left, which is accumulated methane yield in terms of HRT, 
Of course, at longer HRT, accumulated methane yield will be uh, keep increasing. But on the other hand, and the methane production rate, the daily methane production rate will be uh, keep decreasing along with HRT here. So the optimal HRT will be in between somewhere, uh, typically maybe 20 days and between 20 days and 30 days. But again, uh, but I didn't include here in the slide, but you can also simulate uh, this Shen uh, and Hashimoto's mother uh, to predict methane productions by using temperature. Uh, and uh, if you're going to use temperature together with HRT and uh, at uh, longer HRT, you require shorter, uh, quite some lower temperature here. So there's a relations between the HRT and the temperature and also organic loading rate. They are also are combined. So in this way that you can see the effect of retention time both on cumulative methane yield, which is important, but also the other way to the right, it shows daily methane production rate. So because of the typically and uh, bugs plant, in case of thermophilic uh, temperature at uh, retention time, maybe 15 to 20 days, it could be best but on the other hand, uh, mesophilic conditions, because of a lower retention, lower at uh, temperature, the retention time uh, may be at, at least 15 days, uh, typically 30 days. In case of CSTR, don't talk about uh, the UAS direct or solid uh, state retention, uh, solid state on of digestion. So. And this is the uh, last slide uh, showing an example of the best scenario after this uh, Chen and Hashimoto's uh, kinetic modelings. So in this case uh, work uh, using the kinetic modeling we suggest, so this is one example, uh, the best retention time, so you can see here the table, best retention time, uh, uh, just, uh, 16 days, and also the organ loading rate, which is uh, 5.39 uh, kilogram per day per cubic meter. And also here, total solid contents is only 10%. So this is the case of temperature 52 Celsius degree. So based on the recipe, that have a fetus mixture in case of the straw and carrot content and pig slurry at 55, 75% uh, here. So first procedure is decide fetus stock content. So available local biomass and fetus stocks and then optimize a CN ratio between 10 to 50. It should be too high CN ratio and too low CN ratio either. And, and afterwards, and you simulate the methane productions using a chain in Hashimoto's mother. And then you find best organic loan rate. And then you go back and then you re-optimize fetus stock content in this way, and you calibrate and recalibrate and readjust a mixing ratio of different feeder stock. You can also choose some additional feeder stock. You can also uh, some uh, remove some of feeder stock. In this way, and you can see that you can find best production rate and best uh, operational co-digestion conditions here. Um, when I look at this uh, table 4.2, and this is uh, a, a part of project we have done, uh, the BMP uh, here 
around 330, it's uh, relatively low. So when I look at this recipe, it is a mixture as an example here, and straw, which is typical uh, agricultural biomass, and the carrot content, typical uh, carbohydrate, and together with the pig slurry, that what we need is more balance uh, between that uh, protein and lipid. So if you remove a little bit carrot content, and then add a little more and the slaughterhouse waste or some more oil a rich a feeder stock in this way and you can have much more at uh, biogas production but still at organic loading rate uh, the mother says that it cannot be higher than uh, 5.4 to have a be uh, best result this is an example here, which means that in real world, and many times uh, the um, available feeder stocks are really fixed, amount of fixed here. In this way, that the hydraulic retention time can be already uh, decided here. So it is a very open uh, solution to simulate and find the best results. So this is uh, my last, uh, last slide for the code digestion overview and strategy. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know how much I used, uh, 45 minutes. Yes, thank you, Dr. Triolo. Yeah, you were great in the timing, so <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much for your presentation and congratulations for your advanced research on biogas issues. Uh, I'm sure that researchers like you and your colleagues from the university make a relevant difference from, for biogas projects implementations in Denmark and for sure also in other countries. So before we open for, open for questions, I just would like to inform our audience about the next webinar, okay? Just a second, I'm going to speak in Portuguese a little bit. Então, pessoal, dia 29 de julho, só vou querer, quero só comentar com vocês sobre o próximo webinar, vai ser no dia 29 de julho, às 10 horas da manhã, nesse mesmo horário, o tema vai ser biorefinarias e gases renováveis, com o doutor Xavier Flotatis, da, da Universidade Politécnica da Catalunha, tá? A gente vai disponibilizar o, o link também ali no chat, para quem quiser se inscrever e já se programar, ok? So now, Dr. Trillo, we're going to open for questions. So, can you please uh, read the first question, the first question, and then answer it for us? Yeah, but I can see only one question here. And to work with the several types of substrate, one item, and how to choose the right type of a mixer. Ah. Uh, you know that the SDR reactor inside uh, there's some agitations. So, and you don't mix uh, before uh, the SDR reactor. But typically, and the liquid manure go through uh, this liquid uh, uh, manure storage. And the solid, uh, uh, solid feeders like, like uh, uh, um, straw, right? And the straw, and that these are already chopped using hammer mill and they go directly from upper part to the reactor. So in this way, and you don't pre-mix before the CSTAR reactor. So it means that there's some different way to feed reactor. So inside, there's a, because of agitation, they will be harmonized automatically. But in case of uh, solid uh, biomass, for example, and uh, food waste, uh, organic food waste, and then it is important that uh, you need to separate out some uh, impurities like metals and uh, um, plastics uh, that I showed before, and also uh, like uh, wheat straw or bagasse or some, uh, some other some agricultural biomass like uh, solid biomass. And uh, typically, you need to have some special mixer, and uh, we use uh, normally in Denmark products like uh, XTE, and uh, some some simple some hammer uh, to 
uh, reduce particle size uh, down to uh, typically two to uh, three centimeter. So there are some screening. There are some screening for both uh, the liquid manure and also at the solid uh, biomass. But there is no some premix before the uh, biogas reactor. Okay, great. Thank you for the, the answer. Um, yes, yeah, so the second question here, in what condition can microalgae farmers be used in the production of a biogas? Uh, dry or without removing uh, moisture? Mm -hmm. In what condition can microalgae biomass can be used in the production of? Uh, you know that, like uh, I mentioned, about, uh, microalgae, right? So in Tina, the, the idea is that first that you use some uh, agricultural feedstock and animal manure to produce uh, biogas. In the biogas, typically 65% of methane and 35% of uh, the carbon dioxide. So, and they use some photochemical reactor and cultivate microalgae. They need to have uh, some uh, some uh, light. This could be typical some uh, soil energy or some LED uh, light, and to get it with the carbon dioxide. So production will be microalgae. So in this production of microalgae, and typically and uh, uh, some. Uh, Dried content, microalgae content, uh, maximum one percent or two percent, and these microalgae need to be uh, uh, dewatering and remove the water, and then this is used for the, some healthy product or some others a high value product, or this also could be possible to uh, use as a substrate. So if we simulate, uh, we have simulated uh, the case of uh, using this uh, produced microalgae for biogas production, uh, that around 20% of more biogas production. But we are not going to separate. If you're going to separate, you can use some uh, uh, centrifugation or screw press to separate uh, liquid fraction and dried fraction. So this dry depression will be LGI. The LGI need to go back to the progress vector if this LGI is not going to be used for high value product. But if you're going to uh, use this LGI with a full of uh, liquid inside, and if so, that uh, that is also good uh, to optimize dry matter content. Um, as I mentioned before, that by using this Hashimoto's equation that uh, we found out normally at the VS concentration cannot be uh, higher than uh, around 10%. So, um, if, uh, if you want to use this uh, uh, LGI, which is produced from photochemical reactor, then it's good that uh, you can optimize primary content in this way, the substrate you can use more a dry matter uh, concentrated uh, some as here. So it's all up to the system on a digestion system uh, configuration. Great. But, but we have to remember that uh, microalgae is maybe too good to produce biogas. Great, great answer, Dr. Triolo. Let's go for the third one, third question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in the cold digestion, mostly recommended for high rate digesters. As we may know, here in Brazil, most digesters are covered lagoons. Yeah, I know. And in your opinion, what would be the best way to make it uh, feasible? Mm, yeah. You mean here that the uh, most digesters are uh, covered uh, lagoons. Uh, you mean this lagoon is a Vanessa lagoon, right? Uh, Vanessa lagoons uh, here. 
Yeah, um, and such thing as, as well as manure or other kinds of substrates, you know. In Brazil, most part are covered lagoons. Uh, what can I say that, uh, you, you know what, like, um, it was impressive uh, when I was in uh, Brazil or uh, around the Sao Paulo region, uh, there is some uh, landfill, in covered landfill and you produce a biogas and then uh, upgrade biomass into biomethane uh, as a landfill part. The problem with this uh, co-digestion is uh, uh, using CSD reactor still, uh, maybe economically not feasible. Okay. Because uh, the thing is that you need to have some pretreatment. But I'm not talking about pretreatment to improve a biodegradability. I talk about a simple mechanical pretreatment, right? And the to chop up or mix or this, uh, the steel is a very much energy cons uh, cons uh, uh, energy required process right here. So, but also the bargas is not really expensive. And also in case of Brazil, uh, you have a uh, hydropower, the Itabu and uh, full of electricity here. Of course, if we are going to operate this biogas into biomethane uh, and then use this as raw material for something else, uh, and, and, and it does make sense. But still, that uh, uh, economically, and um, I really also wonder about a real a Brazilian model. Okay. In this real Brazilian model, maybe there will be some kind of some hybrid uh, or Brazilian uh, biogas uh, reactor system. This does need to be always cold digestion. But also in, in, in Brazil, it's a huge country here, and the southern part of Brazil, uh, you have some great, uh, good, uh, some uh, livestock product here, productions, uh, and the full of some uh, cold substrate available here. Uh, but if there are two options about this uh, lagoon, or uh, covered lagoon here, but I wonder about this covered lagoon here at uh, um, the methane content, right? Methane content will not be really high uh, as a CSTR reactor because it is not really well optimized. The covered lagoon, the difference between the covered lagoon and the CSTR reactor is uh, two things. No agitation, no heating. Uh, but uh, in case of Brazil, uh, you really need uh, some temperature uh, because it's a uh, cut is warm enough. But regarding this agitation, agitation is good. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I don't have any results of this uh, economy uh, calculation. But it would be some some kind of some lagoon or produce uh, some biogas from lagoon covered lagoon, and it could be maybe economically more feasible. I'm afraid because we have to know that uh, without subsidy. Eh? Uh, without subsidy, uh, it is very hard to be economically feasible. Okay, yeah. Of course, yes, yeah. So, um, so you, you need to find a Brazilian way of a best uh, digestion, co digestion. So. But I can maybe this lagoon is not really uh, co digestion. So you have only one source of a uh, waste or waste water right so. okay i agree then let's go for the fourth question uh so there's some how can i measure the consequences of overload in the physical chemical analysis is there any uh, is there another way yeah uh, 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 overload right overload as long as you have uh, uh, volatile solid concentrations you have volatile solid concentrations. Uh, and then, um, the, generally, I would say that uh, 2 to 8 gram per liter per day, try 2 to 8. So, minimum, it, minimum, there's no minimum actually, but overloading. Uh, as long as I remember from my literature study and highest overloading, which is possible, uh, maybe eight. Okay, eight. 
So, okay. yeah, but, but but this will be really depending on the feedstock uh, uh, composition here. So I would say I would say that if uh, the feedstock is basically uh, the agricultural residue full of uh, green grass or at uh, straw or some bagasse, uh then this can be uh, typically maybe this uh, five or six can also be endurable. And then here the question is that how we can measure. Uh, you cannot measure that you can calculate by using volatile solid concentration that you use volatile solid concentration and divide it by the retention time and then you will see the organic loading weight. But organic loading rate above five is very dangerous. I, I, yeah, but again, depending on the microorganisms. On the feedstock as well, okay. Yeah, I have two yeah. more questions then now to not go for a long time. So the next one, can you read it, please? So what is the best substrate uh, to be used in cold digestion to reduce a high level of... Uh, ah, yeah. And, uh, Use with use high levels of uh, ammonia here. Briefly, it's uh, one of the most frequent uses of uh, uh, on a digestion failure here. Uh, best substrate that you use uh, the carbohydrate based biomass. Definitely, there is no nitrogen inside. But on the other hand, there's a risk of uh, uh, too much carbohydrate compared to uh, uh, nitrogen here. But personally, I have never experienced that, that uh, too much carbohydrate compared to uh, nitrogen here. So don't worry about too much carbohydrate. But if you worry about uh, ammonia inhibition, definitely uh, I recommend that a pH, you cannot adjust pH but of course, you cannot just say, I don't recommend pH at the first month, but uh, temperature should be mass of failure if you worry about. Uh, the substrate, feedstock, uh, any kind of uh, carbohydrate based biomass, and try to reduce, uh, try to reduce uh, some uh, uh, um, protein based. Uh, and also, in case of uh, prime feedstock, and uh, in case Instead of a ketchup manure, uh, a pig slurry will be best. Uh, that uh, there are some several way of avoiding uh, free ammonia inhibition here. Um, but it, you know what is best? Uh, find all the good uh, um, inoculum microorganisms from uh, some Swiss plant or some fungus plant has used the high content of uh, nitrogen as a feedstock before, because uh, substrate is one thing that you can uh, choose to avoid, uh, but it will be really depending on the origin of a microorganism, origin of an uh, inoculum here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Let's go for the last question. Is it gonna be the sixth one? Uh, so this is one from Professor Ariton Cruz. Uh, the in the data comparing HRT and solid concentration, uh, there was no washout of um, methanogenesis for low HRTs. Ah, uh, yes. You know what? In the uh, solid concentration here. Uh, from the Hashimoto's equation here, let me uh, simulate. Uh, this is again depending on the temperature, but uh, Hashimoto's equation says that washout, uh, to avoid washout, at, at least HRT will be 3.5 days. So I didn't show uh, in the, I don't think I have some, I didn't show in the slide in case of washout. But it's washed out if the retention time is shorter than four days. So according to uh, Hashimoto's education, it shows that uh, washed out 
low for days. But in, in the real world, in case of mesophilic conditions, to avoid washout, uh, must be uh, at least 10 days or 15 days of uh, retention time. Okay. okay. In this way, and the hormonal education is also effective to see what are what is the minimum HRT. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Dr. Triolo, for your participation here with us. I'm sure it was very productive, and I am sure the audience like enjoyed it a lot and eu gostaria pessoal de agradecê-los então pela presença aqui conosco nessa manhã com a doutora Triolo, obrigado pelas questões que vocês enviaram, tenho certeza que foram muito é, importantes ali para todos compartilharem as suas dúvidas. So we hope to see you again here in Brazil as soon as possible maybe for our next uh, presential classes with the post-graduation program that we are launching now and thank you very much. So thank you very much See you, I guys. Hope see you guys in the morning. Yeah. We hope the same. Thank you, Thank you very Bye -bye. much, Dr. Tiolo. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.